Fighting Blindness Canada's Young Leaders Program is a career-oriented initiative that provides young people aged 15 to 30 who are blind or partially sighted in Canada with the tools they need to develop skills and pursue rewarding careers. The webinar you're about to watch is a recording. To learn more about this program, visit us online at fightingblindness.ca under the Get Involved tab. The Young Leaders Program is proudly supported by RBC Future Launch. We hope you enjoy this webinar and share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. Good afternoon. Um, so to start off with, um, to our wonderful career panelists, thank you for joining us and I'm excited to hear about your career paths. Um, first question we have for you guys is, um, could you please tell me a little bit about yourselves, where you um, live and where you're currently working? Um, Kia, do you want to start? <laughs> oh, Kia, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, Kia, we can't hear you. You're on uh, mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Kia Osborne. So my right now, my current title, I'm a program lead, a team lead for program development and team lead. Sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting my title. It's quite long. Team lead for program development and program lead for youth empowerment at the CNIB Foundation. So originally, I am I grew up, born and raised in Montreal, and in 2001, I immigrated to well. Trans transition to Toronto for a career. So I originally started out, I was uh, with my education, I was educated, I have a bachelor's um, in marketing, in fashion marketing. So before me living in Toronto, I, I came to Toronto in 2001, uh, from 1996 to 1998. So I'm, I'm dating myself here. Uh, I lived in New York City and to study fashion marketing. And then after that, came back to Montreal for about a year and a half, uh, worked in fashion on contracts. And then I came to Toronto in 2001, where I worked in the, I worked with an agency that helped, assisted in building nonprofit uh, direct marketing campaigns. And then I transitioned, uh, working in that industry for about a year, then I transitioned, I went back to school to become a registered massage therapist. So quite a few careers, <laughs> did that for 12 years. And then for the past four years, I've been working in the role I'm, I'm currently now at CNIB as a program lead for youth and also getting into more of the management side of things with program development. That's awesome, thank you. Um, does someone else want to go next? <laughs> Or should I call out names? <laughs> I'll, I'll go next if no one else wants to speak. So um, my name's Stuart. I'm originally from Ottawa, but I've been living in Toronto now for, God, probably 20 years now, I guess. Um, so I've always loved science from the day I was born. And I did an undergrad in science, started grad school in Toronto. And three years in, when I was considering being an optometrist, I got diagnosed in the chair while in an information interview with RP. And that's when I first found out about my vision loss and didn't know exactly how to, what to make of it and got connected luckily with the, the foundation and with a few other organizations. And ultimately I actually became a high school teacher for five years teaching science, but realized I really meant to be, was meant to be in grad studies and be a scientist. So I went back to school and started a PhD and it's been a ride, <laughs> which I'll tell you more about, but it's been a, a real learning experience and um, really empowering actually in a lot of ways and so uh, yeah I, I am a person who still really loves science and, and really feel like I said in my bio very strongly that a visual impairment actually is an asset versus anything else and I'll tell you more about it uh, later so yeah that's me awesome and um, next Clover do you want to go yeah, sure, I'll go. Um, so hi, my name is Clover, Clover Kwaka Um I was, um, I, I was, I pretty much was born and raised in the GTA area. 
grew up in Oyam Oakville for a while, spent some time in Toronto just from virtue of being school. And I kind of just like live and kind of work in and around the kind of Burlington Hamilton area now. Um, I guess I, I feel like I'm, I'm probably one of the more younger people on this panel, not to like throw shade at anyone, honestly. But um, so I'm still kind of definitely on, on working through my career right now. Uh, currently, I work for myself um, a little bit. Um, so I kind of nowadays, especially with the COVID, I've actually been doing kind of more freelance work and getting more involved in sort of community programs and uh, community um, public art and things like that. Um, I had re very recently um, worked with the CNIV as sort of their youth leadership intern and kind of worked as a program coordinator, um, developing sort of programs, um, art programs that, um, you know, were accessible and um, practical for people with sight loss. And then I was, had currently finished a contract with working with the CNIB Phone It Forward program, which was a really cool and interesting experience. Um, and then COVID happened. And now, like I said, I'm sort of working for myself. <laughs> so that's, that's me in a nutshell. And I'm sure I'll get more into it later, but. Yeah, for sure. I'm excited to hear it. And Nick. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Nick D'Ambrosio. I live in Montreal, Canada. I've been working at a drugstore uh, as a clerk for the last 23 years. Um, I also do some podcasting on the side to help out blind abilities with Jack Thompson and Pete Lane and also do a community report on AMI for the city of Montreal. Um, so that's it. I've been living with RP since I was five. So it's been, I like to call it like a little bit of a Chinese water torture, slow, slow uh, lowering of vision throughout all my years. I have very little functional vision now, but still holding my job and still uh, doing well and uh, continuing to help and try to motivate people uh, with vision loss to continue on their journey, their path. And, uh, you know, with all the difficulties that we may um you know, encounter. I've had many, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit later, and my journey through where where I've been and where I got to. So uh, it's been fun, and it's it's more the journey, not the destination. Like I said in uh, my little bio. Yeah, for sure. Wow, you guys. Some very interesting um, career paths so far. Um, can I just? I want to know a little more about your particular. Um, career path, of, I would say, your current um, career particular. Um, I guess I'll go in first this time. Yeah, go ahead. Go. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, <laughs> my career path uh, didn't start off so smoothly. Um, I was in denial for many years. Then one, you know, it's the, it's the same story with people with vision loss and you know with RP. I, I was in denial for many many years of my life, from practically you know almost a decade, decade and a half. And um, I went through high school. I went through college with uh, functional vision. I'd like to call it. We kind of got by. Uh, shared notes with friends of mine and, and got through high school. Got through college. Uh, with a social degree. And then when I went to university, all bets were off. Uh, auditoriums, professors weren't as accommodating. And again, it was no fault to them because I really wasn't disclosing my, my problem as much. So I decided to go on a different career path. I wanted to work. I wanted to be part of, um, you know, I wanted to contribute to society and continue to work. I didn't want to just stop my life. So I took a one-year intensive course in bookkeeping and I passed and I did that. But when I went inside the real world, I noticed that, again, my eyesight became a big problem and I had to, well, basically I got fired, it, you know, and uh, from there on in, it was very difficult to pick up the pieces, but um, I had to pick up the pieces and that's where acceptance finally came in. I knew that I was I needed outside help from organizations and blind institutes uh, to get me through the the path that I needed to get to. Uh, when I did go to the MAB here in Montreal, I told them, "Look, I'm just willing to work and do anything." And I did take a job at a pharmacy, which was you know quite a long time ago. 
Um, at the beginning, it was very difficult and I uh, had to prove myself. Uh, you know, there were all the stigmas that come with people that are blind and we need to monitor you. And But eventually, um, I said an independence and I was very vocal on what I could and couldn't do. And so I, I succeeded in keeping my job for as many years as I have. Uh, but I felt unfulfilled. Um, I felt that, you know, I wanted to do more, uh, that this wasn't my quote unquote, life long dream. Uh, so I decided to go into podcasting and radio and, you know, and I met a lot of wonderful people through my journey that have continued uh, to help me uh, get to things that I love to do. And, and so now I found the perfect balance from work, which I want to keep. I've, you know, I've worked very hard for many years to keep that job. And um, and also I found uh, joy in helping others and doing uh, my passions, which are radio and podcasting and, and helping others. I guess that's pretty much a wrap. <laughs> right. Who wants to go next? <laughs> I'll take the plunge. <laughs> okay. So this is Kia. So my career path. Uh, was again was not it was unconventional as well I had you know going through the Montreal system is a bit different from Toronto so when I was in CJEP which is I guess equivalent to your grade 12 13 I didn't have a direction in the beginning I thought okay I'm going to study science become a doctor um, I wanted to actually become an ophthalmologist but again not realizing how much sight is needed uh, my those dreams were deterred because I have retinopathy of prematurity, so I have minimal vision in my right eye and no vision in my left. <clears throat> so uh, I started really examining. I always loved art and fashion, and decided to take a total, like uh, take a 360, or say 180, and uh, go into fashion. And you know, I did my fashion education, my formal, formal fashion education in Montreal and again I was the only person with sight loss they've ever encountered doing fashion because again they always thought you know fashion is perceived to be a visual thing which it's there's so much it's it's so multifaceted there's so much more to it than this the visual aspect and especially with marketing um so again I had to advocate teach you know really help them really use those communications to help them understand what my needs were. And they were quite, they tried their best. And I, I said, they did an efficient job at the time, because again, the provisions they have now weren't, you know, the, the accessibility that they have now, they didn't have it back then when I was, in, when, stud when I was studying. And then the, when I decided to pursue my education in New York City, same thing. I was the only person they've ever encountered in that school, that university, because again, everybody's very, you know, you're, they're a fashion stylist, fashion designers, marketing, no one with sight loss. So again, had to advocate, really had to educate on what my needs are as a person with sight loss, make them understand that, yes, I do have sight loss, but I am capable. Uh, that being said, I mean, education-wise, it was great, a lot of hard work, Again, I had to really cut corners or be creative with my learning when there wasn't a lot of accessibility at my fingertips. Um, yes, I was, again, growing up in Montreal, I was a client of the MAB, the Montreal Association for the Blind. So they had a laptop, but I had, you know, at the time I had um, Zoom text only uh, magnification. I, in, you know, in my educational studies and in my work life, I realized I do need, I need the both audio and visual, but again, you have to be really creative to get around things. But the only thing I can say with my educational journey, it was great. But again, transitioning into the workforce, that's where there were issues because again, the way, what you learn in school, how you navigate in, in the educational system is totally different from when you finally get out in the real world, in the work world where again, employers may not have any understanding, they may not understand what accommodations you need. And also too, you have to make sure that your, your technology, your work skills or those transitional skills are in place and mine worked. So I was, it was a hard reality to know that 
at the time when transitioning out of the university because you think you have big dreams, I'm going to be a director. I thought, age 29 or 30, I'm going to be a director of marketing. I'm on my way. And I was let go of jobs. I was walked out of jobs because I couldn't keep up and they didn't understand what my needs were. So those are some hard lessons. But again, my dream, you know, your dreams are always, I realize that you can't always go with the, the straight path. There's always going to be some crooked paths, but it'll, eventually it'll lead you where you're supposed to be. So with my fashion background, you know, I made the, made the, the swerve to really educate myself. I had to work. I became a massage therapist. So that's where the science, the love of science came in. And in those, in that journey, and meeting different people and integrating into the, you know, I decided, okay, when I came to Toronto, I'm going to really integrate into the sight loss community and understand and meet others like myself because I grew up, I grew up integrated. I didn't grow up in the sight loss community. So having that, I think having that experience, um, you know, volunteering and interacting and really making those core relationships with others like myself who understood the struggles and, they edified me and helped me really come to terms with what I need, help me propel myself into the career direction I'm, I, I took now. So uh, taking those different the turns in life will definitely, those are great stepping stones for you to get to where you want to be. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Clover, do you want to go next? Yeah, I'll go next. Um, I, you know, it's funny, I, I, you know, I remember also being a bit of a science, like, geek when I was growing up, and then thinking I was going to be a biologist, and that didn't happen either, so <laughs> it's kind of funny how that works out, but, um, yeah, so I guess sort of my journey has been, I, it has, it's, it has, it has a, had a lot of caveats, um, again, I feel like my career is still sort of getting started, um, but it definitely was a process of even getting to where I am, where I do feel like I'm at the cusp of something, um, so um, I had grown up integrated. Um, I, I never really kind of um, grappled with my sight loss until a little later in life. Um, uh, at first I was di diagnosed with RP because um, my brother actually has it. So the doctors were like, well, that's what you got. Um, and But growing up, I'd always loved art. Always, always, always. Um, I had been drawing since I was a child and I really, really loved it. But just knowing that I had been sort of diagnosed with um, a condition, I never really thought like I could pursue it um, with any seriousness. Um, and I kind of thought, had that in mind as I went through high school and I was thinking like, oh, maybe I could be a lawyer or maybe I could be an architect, which, oh, whoops, like, like you know, like all these different avenues. And I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, um, but I had always taken art classes um, consistently through high, throughout high school. and. Uh, you know, I was good at it. Like at a point, my teacher was making me redo assignments or do them twice over because I would just get them done so quickly. Um, and she asked me if like, are you thinking about pursuing this like professionally? And it was interesting because that was the first time anyone had ever, um, I guess, sort of acknowledged that, like that kind of desire in me. And I thought, yeah, like I could, I could do this. Um, so, um, before I, I had applied for art school, um, I thought I didn't get in because they told me otherwise, but I did. And um, the summer before I, you know, could go, um, I was properly diagnosed with Stargardt at 18. And I kind of asked my doctor kind of square in the face, you're like, should I go for this? And he was like, you know what? Give it a shot. <laughs> so I did. And I decided um, I went to... Um, OCAD University, it's an art school here in Toronto. Um, and I remember the whole experience being like my first time being really nerve wracking. Um, uh, the thing with art school, it's a very, especially in first year, it's a very um, public thing and you have to learn to kind of take criticism and um, kind of get a thicker skin. Um, so that was a bit of a struggle and also just sort of working with my sight loss. Um, I do have quite a bit of functional vision, but definitely it was something that my school had to think, deal, think about because I went to school for illustration, which is a visual art. Um, 
And that was an interesting experience. I actually found myself, I didn't disclose as much as I should have um, with some of my courses. In my more academic courses, I did. But for one of some more of my practical, um, my practical um, classes, I was a bit stubborn. And I, I wanted to see if how, what I could do if I, you know, was given the same um, kind of same time frames and uh, constructions as my peers, which in a sense was, um, I, I, I don't recommend doing that because honestly, especially when you're learning, it's, it's best to, it's best to give yourself the opportunity to learn. But I definitely learned something from that. Um, and I had a lot of interesting professors who, um, who reminded me that my sight loss wasn't something that was a deterrent per se actually or that it rather gave me a more interesting perspective than my peers um and uh, that really stuck with me i had one professor in particular who told me that when i was really felt like i felt like i was struggling with an assignment but in reality i guess i wasn't um and then after sort of I've, i graduated and sort of uh graduated um i I've worked a lot of odd jobs. Um, I've been in a lot of different industries while I was in school and sort of shortly after. Uh, I worked in the hospitality industry, um, serving factories, restaurants, all sorts of things, moving. I was a bed bug exterminator when I was um, 18. <laughs> so um, there was a, a lot of different industries that I worked within because um, I, couldn't, I couldn't do the typical sort of cashier job at the supermarket. And um, it was interesting just sort of um, disclosing in these kind of industries, especially when they were sort of male dominated industries as well. Um, but honestly, it, it got to a point where you just had to kind of, if to be firm of like knowing what you could can do and not letting people push you to do things that you, you feel isn't safe for you. So that's something. And uh, when I graduated, I, actually started working at Walmart just to pay down some student bills and kind of start my sort of career and my sort of my own freelance. And while I was doing that, I was determined to kind of create more projects for myself. So I started um, doing sort of art markets and selling my work at conventions, doing that run and finding community there. Um, I started opening up my own sort of online store. Um, and started taking in more freelance while I was working full time at like Walmart or something. And I, I wanted to do more and I wanted to actually connect more with sort of the site loss community that I wasn't, hadn't been a part of really. So I started volunteering for the CNIB. Um, I started um, developing sort of art programs that would, that would be interesting to people with site loss and uh, focusing on the fact that doing art doesn't necessarily have to lead to to something it can you can enjoy the process no matter where you are or what your abilities are and then that kind of snowballed into me working with the CNIB for a bit and taking some contract work and that was a really awesome experience and it's really given me sort of a taste for how um, how else sort of creativity translates into so many other different careers and so many other different job restrictions descriptions without us really knowing um, so I've definitely kind of gotten a taste for sort of working in community projects, things like that. And currently, as COVID time happens, I've been really kind of ramping up and working on my own freelance. And again, working with different cities of creating art that is usually public art that's, you know, talks about diversity, whether it is um, with disability or even just like representation of women, LGBT, LGBTQ issues or, you know, uh, racial issues. So I'm always fascinated seeing how all that connects and it's kind of really rewarding work. And as I'm kind of sitting here, that's sort of what my, I want my future to be. Um, so that's, that's sort of me. I know I felt like I waffled on a little bit, but that's sort of my, my very zigzaggy um, journey <laughs> so far. Oh, that's awesome. All right, um, Stuart, do you want to call? Uh, sure. Um, so, I guess I've encountered it all in the time when I was in grad school um, from people who have said, you know, we want to support you, what do you need? To people who have said, we don't believe you can do it. We don't think you're capable of doing it. To people who've, you know, the whole spectrum. And 
I guess there's a few things that I've learned from my journey to get to where I am now. Um, the biggest key for me is that communication is key. Um, now, I just want to make sure, can everybody hear me? Yeah, I, okay, people can hear me? Okay, good. So I guess the biggest thing for me has been that communication is key. Uh, communication has to start with yourself. So you need to figure out for yourself first what you need. So the more you know what work you're going to be doing or what you want to be doing, to start doing the process before or as soon as you can of figuring out what supports you need to do the work you're going to need to do or want to do. And it's a process. And I had to do a lot of the process in line. Like while I was doing my grad studies, I was had to also figure out how to actually do microscopy and stuff as a person who's visually impaired, which was, uh, is a lot more difficult than I imagined it would be. Uh, I'll tell you after, I know somebody who's doing this as a postdoc right now, who's visually impaired and she does a lot of using microscopes and stuff. It's incredible. But I had to do it in line. If I had done it in advance and actually worked it out, it would have been a lot easier. So communication with yourself to start, to figure out what you need. Um, but then also as open communication with your bosses and your supervisors as you possibly can. And I know it's scary. But the sooner you disclose, the sooner you're straight up with your people you work for and say, I am visually impaired, this is where, who I am, this is where I'm at, and this is what I need to the greatest extent that you can, the better situation you'll be in. It's that simple because often there's a lot of fear with the idea of what is this person going to need to succeed, you know, is it going to be possible, all this kind of thing. The more you can actually know that for yourself and, and inform the people around you, the more empowered you'll be, the more you'll be able to succeed. Um, the other big thing, the big lesson I learned is initially my thought was, I'm going to do it all myself. You know, oh, I'm going to take this on, I'm going to be fine, I'm visually impaired, ah, but I can do it all myself. That was really, really short-sighted as far as I'm concerned, because it led to me getting injured a few times, and, which is not good. Uh, you know, little things, but, you know, to be able to ask for help was a big thing as well. So to always say, whenever I was doing anything in, in work situations, I can't do it myself. So I didn't admit this to myself first, number one, I can't do it myself. I need help, and that's okay. And that asking for help is the right thing to do, the best thing to do, and, you know, will benefit me and has benefited me through all my grad studies. The other major thing that has been a huge benefit for me is technology. Um, I didn't know how, and I'm biased in some way you'll see, but I didn't know how incredible Macintosh machines and Mac generally is for accessibility. Their features are all built into all their devices across the line for free. So you have everything you can imagine. And so it's what's enabled me to remain a scientist. I actually had a point in my career so I changed labs. I started my PhD in one lab, but I got about two years in my PhD and to put it lightly, it got to a place where they said I wasn't a good fit anymore. And I'll go more into the story offline if anyone wants to know, but I had to figure out how I was going to continue. And so I ended up becoming what's known as a bioinformatician. So I do all my work on computers and I got to a place where I could do basically everything a bioinformatician could do without sight. So essentially it could be site free. And that was only because of Mac, because of all the features they built into their operating system. So they're incredibly powerful, they're really valuable. And it's a way um, to really allow for one to find ways to do, you know, just about anything really. I mean, um, so I really like the idea that there is something about being visually impaired which empowers people in addition, and, and I really believe that. And, and what I really mean by that is this, that people I have met from the visually impaired community are the most resilient, creative, caring, interesting, amazing people that I've ever met. And it's because they're forced to be in some ways, because <laughs> you have to find creative solutions to, your, to the ways to do things. And that empowers me, at least I, I can only speak for myself, but that's really empowered me to be able to be creative in everything I do and to be able to find solutions where there don't appear to be any and to be the most resilient person I could ever imagine I could be. And that's a characteristic that isn't as necessarily common in the general population because there isn't as much pressure to have that. So it can be in that way, I see as really good motivation to, to build that. Um, so really, I mean, really what I wanna say is when it comes to your career, you know, be upfront, be honest as much as you can and revisit it as much as you can to see what you need, understand what you need, communicate it as best you can, as clear as you can. Have networks of connections. That's such a brilliant idea uh, when that was said because the more people who've gone through it before um, can help you to really 
find what works for you. So it's going to differ from every single person. Um, and I mean, just to put it out there anyway, I said this before, but I'll say it again for anybody in the summit, um, consider me a contact from now until all time for anything. If anybody needs anything, you can always email me and I'm happy to respond to anybody because I, I'm glad to help. I've gone through what I've gone through, not everything, but I'd be happy to help if anyone needs anything. Um, and just to give insight if, if I have anything to share, but really, yeah, clear communication, a, a clear understanding of what you need can communicate to others and, and know that you have a right for it. And with those supports in place, you can do just about anything, really if the sports in place and in some cases better than other people can do it i think genuinely so anyway that's that's what, that's me i didn't talk really much about science but basically that's sort of you know it's worked for me so anyway that's it um yeah no thank you so much there's a lot that i want to like say and contribute and keep the conversation going unfortunately like we are kind of short running um at a time, um, I'm going to pass it to Amanda to um, pick it up from here and continue with a bit more um, conversation. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. It's, it's what a great panel so far. Um, uh, so my question for everyone, and I'm going to start with Clover on this one, um, is if you can outline an employment challenge that you faced and how did you handle it? How did you respond or address it? That's interesting. Um, like I said, I, I'd worked a lot of uh, different jobs and probably in different environments that people didn't expect me to be in. Um, one being, which is funny, it's not really related to art, but sure. Um, I had worked at a restaurant and it was, um, I had I had worked a lot at this restaurant. Um, I was actually saving up to um, be able to move down to Toronto for my last year of school. But um, I was the dishwasher there because um, at that point um, I had been a server, but my vision had kind of deteriorated um, to a point where it was a bit difficult. And I don't know why restaurants love dark mood lighting, but they do. So I, I'd actually switched to working in the back more as the dishwasher. And I had been had a lot of different responsibilities um, kind of stacked on me during the summer the summer months where things got really crazy um and at some point um they had i and at this whole this whole time of working there for a couple months i hadn't actually disclosed um my my condition because to be honest it didn't really affect me too much i all i had to do was wash dishes um but when i had been asked to kind of have more responsibility and i was kind of really pressured into like you know um they call them um, like ex expediters, so people who read out the men like the orders and stuff, and kind of manage the kitchen. And I said I had just um, frank, very frankly, and very um, calmly had just told my supervisor that I can't do this. And then he had turned to me and said, "Is it because you can't do it, or you do not want to do it?" And I said, "I can't do this because you know I have sight loss." Um, uh, and um, I'm not able to read things to a degree that would be able to help out, but I can do so, a lot of other things. And um, I actually ended up working as sort of the assistant pasta chef instead. So I guess in a sense, um, having sort of different challenges, um, it's, it's as, as a lot of very um, articulate people have said, it's really just sort of being disclosing, um, kind of knowing knowing your limits and playing within it sort of thing. And um, also offering, trying your best to offer a solution because it's a lot of times where a lot of employers or people have, don't know what to do when you, when you disclose and they don't know where to go from there. And no one knows sort of your situation better than you do. So um, I think it's, I think when disclosing, it's always good to kind of have a, have a kind of a, a, even a, an idea of a solution that's um, of, of how to um, sort of solve the problem because a lot of people don't know when they need the help. For sure, very, very excellent points. Um, I can pick someone or if anyone else wants to go next, feel free. I'll go. Sure. Um, so network, 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 network. It has have as many connections as you possibly can. Um, my situation was I was two years into my PhD uh, my supervisor had basically 
we had a discussion and we came to the quote unquote agreement that I should pack it in and find another career. Um, and what saved me ultimately, I emailed every single one of the supervisors in the entire department. No one was willing to take me on. So I was basically a PhD student without a lab. But then I reached out to an old colleague from eight years ago who I hadn't spoken to in those eight years. And I was like, hi, guess what? It's your friend from eight years ago. Here's my situation. I'm looking for a lab. Might you be willing to take me on? He said no, but then he said, I do do collaborations with this other guy. And that's who I now work for. And who I've been working, who I've been working for for the last four years. And it was only because of that one connection that I'm now still doing a PhD. If it wasn't for that, I would not be in my, in my program. So, you know, the more you network, the more connections you have, the more wisdom you'll have, the more solutions you'll have, and the more connections you'll have generally. And you never know when they'll come in handy. Um, that is, the, in, in every respect, it's the best thing. So that's it for me. All right, Nick, Kia. So um, <clears throat> one of my jobs, uh, this is in the early uh, jobs where I was in fashion uh, marketing. So I was a, um, an assistant at the time using um, Zoom text as my assistive technology of choice at the time. And the, they were, I mean, they understood, they tried to understand what my, what my capabilities and limitations were. I was very transparent with them. And one of them, one of the things was at this particular office, now they, I need, I need to make sure I had um, specific lighting to do my job. So, they had some restructuring and they moved me where I was under a skylight. So having light coming, casting down the computer screen, blinding. Uh, I had to advocate, let them know, you know, I can't see, I cannot do my job this way. I cannot see, can you please, is there a possibility we can move? I know our department has moved, but I, I'm unable to do my job. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't comply and I had to leave um, because, again, I don't want to work somewhere where you're almost sabotage. It was almost like there, it was a bit of sabotage because I think they, they didn't know how to deal with, deal with a person with sight loss, understand my needs, so they didn't comply and I left. Um, that being said, in the next job, uh, what I learned, again, having that self, not being afraid to self-advocate for yourself because you have the, you know, you need to you know what you're capable of bringing. Again, disclosing is important and making sure that they understand your needs so they don't use it against you. Uh, the next job, I was transparent. I asked, you know, I, I did tell them what happened in the previous job. These are, the, these are my needs. This is how, you know, I need to be placed this in such a way. I need my computer screen and a certain monitor. And they were very accommodating. This is when I moved to Toronto and I was working in another marketing firm. And very accommodating. Anything I wasn't able to do, uh, I worked with another coordinator, so anything, it, if it was too visual, um, they didn't have the, uh, the technology to maybe enhance it for me or to enlarge it, they took on those aspects. And then when I became more proficient in the job, I was able to do other tasks. So they really worked, they really helped me work on what my strengths were and, and things that I wasn't capable of, capable of due to maybe lack of technology on their side, they really fought to accommodate. So that was, that self-advocacy and really standing up for yourself. And even if you have to leave in order to get, you know, if they're not respecting you, don't be afraid to leave because there's always, it may take some time, but there's always another job. Great advice. Thanks. Thanks everyone. And last but not least, Nick. Um, when I started at my pharmacy job, I was kind of like the gopher. And uh, for a long period of time, I, I wasn't very happy and I was about to quit. And um, um, I dealt with a lot of confidence issues, you know, not disclosing my vision loss. And, you know, although it was kind of evident, but I was still not there yet. Uh, the one thing that I urge people to do is believe in yourself, b believe in your abilities. Uh, once I finally opened my mouth and said, you know what, I went to, uh, my managers and I said, look, I'm not, I'm not here to be the gopher. I'm here to do a job or take responsibilities. And they kind of 
went back and said, okay, wait a minute. So what do you want to do? And, you know, having an open dialogue, uh, creating bonds, uh, you know, I wouldn't say friendships, you know, they are coworkers, you know, you have your friends, your coworkers, but you need to have some kind of working relationship with the people there. And I think being vocal and, and, and saying what you need and what you want is so important. Uh, we all have, you know, I'll speak for myself. I had, you know, confidence issues. We are going in a strange environment with a lot of obstacles to face. And so we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to cause trouble. We just want to do our job and go home. But in reality, we have to be vocal. Networking, again, I, I can't even stress how important that is as well. And, and get as many people as you want. And just recently, within the last two years, uh, I was about to quit again. Um, my vision has gotten so bad that I cannot tell the products anymore. I, I can't do my job as a clerk to put away stock. And I said, okay, this is it. And I said, you know what? I shouldn't give up. You know, blind people, well, we are adapting every moment. And I said, oh, wait a minute. There's technology. And I took the technology out of my pocket and I downloaded an app called Seeing Assistant Home and put all of my inventory in my phone so that I can scan each product. And I, now that has continued uh, to keep my job for, I don't know, as, you know, as many years as I would like to. Uh, with my, you know, my memory of my section and stuff, I can continue on working because of technology as well. So, you know, just to wrap it up, there's so many, lots of great stories and advice, but, you know, we're all kind of going into the same thing. Networking, stay confident, be strong, be a voice, don't be scared, and, um, and create friendships and bonds with people. And, you know, and like someone just said, sorry, uh, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world if it doesn't work out. We've all lost jobs and we're all gonna gain other jobs. And sometimes we'll find it. And even if you in or you're in a job that you may not enjoy fully, but you know, you need to survive. We all need to survive. There are other ways to fulfill your life like I did doing AMI and doing podcasting to have a very enjoyable life and you know, just doing what you do. I stress everybody to go with their passion and what they love and go for it. But uh, in the meantime, everything is uh, a journey. And, the, you know, and, and I learned so much going through each step that the destination now is almost irrelevant. And I'm so happy I went through all those hardships to get to where I am. So I just urge everyone to continue to go forward and, and not give up on your dreams, and on your schooling, on whatever it is you want to do. Uh, and hopefully uh, the ship will right itself. Uh, you know, if your hard work and determination will get you to where you are uh, with, uh, again, a lot of confidence and a lot of uh, kind of a little swagger in your walk because uh, one thing that employers want to look at is strong individuals. They don't want uh, people that are uh, kind of down on themselves. Well, I can't do this and I can't do that. No, I can do this and I can do that. How about you accommodating me? Again, you know, you can't be brash, can't be too overconfident or you're, you know, you might rub people the wrong way. But uh, in the way you say things, things can be uh, accomplished very well. It's not how you, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Great. Thanks so much, Nick. And thanks to everyone <clears throat> for answering that question. Um, we'd now like to open the floor up to questions. I know there are some questions in the chat. Um, Morgan, maybe you can help read those out. Um, but if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask in the chat or via audio, um, raise your hand and we will address you. Perfect. All right, so let's start. We have a couple in the chat here. Um, this first question is for Kia uh, from Ramya. Um, so she said, Kia, was it mostly encouraging or challenging to have multiple career and job options and transitions? She says, I have many interests and sometimes I wonder if moving from career to career is against the grain. Oh, good question. At first, because again, as I mentioned, I had a, I had a laser focus, especially coming out of the university, I'm going to be in fashion marketing. This is what I'm going to do. These are the steps because, you know, you have your ambitions and your dreams. So when, of course, that didn't happen, you got to be able to, and I guess, you know, if you're an art, you know, especially for artists or you're, you're in the creative field, you got to be able to be a chameleon. And it can work. At first I thought, oh gosh, it's not going to work to my advantage, but it actually has because, again, 
I went back to my old interest when, again, the marketing wasn't working out. Okay, I need to pay rent. I need to eat. I need to move forward. I, when I took the, took the child, the leap to re-educate myself, became a massage therapist, worked in that field, and then I said, okay, I need to figure out what's the next step. And again, making those connections, because I want to work with people with sight loss, but I want to do something different. That's where I was able to extract, you know, the, that, the helping side of my job. I, I extracted from the marketing, I extracted from the fashion, and I was, I'm able, it kind of for rate to what I'm doing right now. I can, I've made this career where I'm, a, where I create programs for youth into what I want to be, where I, I was fortunate to have the creative license to do all those things. So let's say you're, um, you know, like Clover's in art. So she brought that into, she can bring art, art into her job where she may not be creating, but she's helping others create. So everything can lead you into what you want to do. So having multi, being multifaceted, I think it's an asset because where one thing doesn't work out, you can fall back onto another talent. I think I love seeing people with different talents because your world is just, it just opens up your world. I can agree more. That's going back to my biology background too, right? It's like survival. <laughs> the more exactly. adaptable species is, the more likely they are to survive, right? Um, so I have a question here for uh, Stuart. Um, so Hamid asks, how would you compare your time in graduate stu uh, studies versus your undergrad? So he says, as an engineer, I know graduate studies in science sciences usually involves a lot of lab time, which is very hands-on. What kind of challenges did you face in the lab and how did you overcome them? Okay, so um, they're very different beasts. Um, an undergrad, you're doing courses, completing exams, and doing a very set curriculum. A grad studies program, you're doing a project pretty much for yourself. So you take on a project, and you're—I don't see—I don't mean on your own. What I mean to say is that motivation, to a great extent, in undergrad comes from your professors because they say you need to hand this by then. You have to do this and that. In your grad studies, you're the one who motivates yourself mostly, and you have to really take on projects uh, and decide how the project goes ultimately and, and you, what you want to work on, what you don't want to work on. Most importantly of all things, who you want to work with. That is the number one, two, three, and four, and five thing you want to consider if you ever do grad studies. It does not matter what you do. It matters on who you do it with. Um, but the big difference then is really is you're thinking for yourself. It's a lot more independence, and in that, it's so much better as far as I'm concerned because you just have a chance to explore what you are interested in. You get to do what you want to work on and explore really interesting things, no matter whether it's sciences or humanities or anything, you get to really explore things at a whole other level. Um, and so I you know, would highly recommend it, whether or not ultimately in the end you work on what you studied, the skills you gain over your doctoral studies or whatever grad studies you do, you will keep for the rest of your life. And they're incredibly valuable because the resilience you know, the hard work, the willingness to say you don't know something, the willingness, willingness you need to ask questions and things. I mean, it's really um, incredibly valuable, but definitely a very different beast than the undergrad uh, because of the independence. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I think that was great. Um, okay, so and again, remember people out there in the audience, if you want to uh, ask a question over audio, you can raise your hand. I thought there was someone, but the hand seems to have gone down. So um, we have some more questions in the Q&A. Um, let's see, so Nokita asks, uh, when do you think is the best time to disclose that you have a disability? Maybe we could go to um, Nick or Clover, someone who hasn't answered a question yet. Um. I disclosed it right away. Um, again, this is a touchy subject with a lot of people, whether you disclose, you know, my abilities are what my abilities are and they shouldn't define me because of my thing, uh, my disability. Um, I just felt that it was just easier to disclose uh, right off the bat uh, and let them know uh, that this is what they were, you know, preparing for me um, to get a head start uh, in, in many aspects because sometimes you're putting the employer, you know, in a bad situations, but I understand both aspects. Uh, it, it, I think it's a personal, it's a personal decision. Uh, but in, for me, uh, I, I did it that way and I will always do it that way. I just feel that I don't want to waste time 
Um, my abilities will speak for themselves. And, and, and the way I kind of look at it, if they don't want me, uh, it's their loss because, uh, um, you know, I think how I'm a great worker and so forth. And I'm going to, I'm going to make that known at the beginning of the interview of what my abilities are and what I can do. And so, uh, but I understand that sometimes, uh, they will judge even before interviewing you. So it's a, it's a tough call, but, uh, I, I'd go with, I would, I would go with disclosing. I don't know. I, I could be on the crunch. I could be different opinions, but, uh, that's where I'm going to go with. Great. Um, okay, I think Sophia has her hand up, so I'm going to unmute Sophia. Um, feel free to, you can unmute yourself on your end now. Ask your question. Let's give her a sec here. Zoom webinar window, lower hand. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, I have a question um, for anybody. Um, you know how you were saying about disclosing your disability Messages, and all, uh, um, it, how would be, what is the best way to disclose your disability to your boss and like, y y y you know, so they can like accept you in not like a professional manner, like how do you, do you guys disclose your disability? Can I answer this one? Absolutely, go for it. Okay. Um, so, I'm going to say two different things, um, how I disclosed and what the best way is to disclose. <laughs> um, so, how I disclosed, which I thought still was pretty good, was I came right up to my supervisor, I'm like, here's the thing. And, she, and it's sort of funny because my supervisor was somebody I knew from the blindness community, as it happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> she already knew me, and so she knew things about me, and so she knew I had RP and other things. So, she sort of already knew in a way. Um, but I, I was very straight up. I said, you know, here's, here's the thing. Here's my, here's my disability. But then I left it there. I didn't really say like, you know, and here are ways that you can support me and things. I just like, I have RP. And then I just left it there. <laughs> like left it lying there right in, in the conversation. Um, the best way to do it is to read a document that was written about five or six years ago, maybe more. There's a guy whose name is Mahadeo Sukai. And he did a study of all graduate students across Canada who are, have disabilities to study how they interacted with their supervisors, how they managed interactions with their supervisors. And he did a full on meta study of how it went down and he actually prepared a final report on what worked and what didn't work. And the report is available. I forget the link right now offhand, but that report outlines, how do you talk to a supervisor if you need to disclose? What are ways, what are the steps to take to do it in an effective way? What is a plan you can work with with your supervisor to plan out how to get supports and everything. It's a really incredibly powerful document. I don't know if it's evolved, if there's been another version since then, but it's, it's amazing. And uh, I'll, I'll give my link, the link to the document to Morgan afterwards, and you can share it around if you want. But I would say read that document and use that as your roadmap for how to disclose. And, and that's your best way. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah, I can definitely share that if you send it to me, Stuart. That's awesome. All right, so I think we have time for this one last question, uh, which I think is a fantastic question. Um, it says, growing up with vision loss, did you guys have any role models that you looked up to in the low vision community? Um, so we can maybe start with Clover on this one. Hi. Um, I, I would say I was actually quite lucky because I actually have an older brother who has sight loss and he has always been sort of a support and inspiration to me. But I definitely didn't find a lot of role models um, outside of that until I started getting more connected with the sight loss community and I started to really realize I started finding people who not only had my condition but also who were within my field which was absolutely mind-blowing to me as I went through school being like the only visual artist I knew was sight loss and then I had suddenly discovered a whole different treasure trove of other people I could talk to about things and kind of get gain mentorship from so um, and that's also kind of a thing that's kind of motivates, I think, all of us here is that uh, in programs like this is we are trying to be more out there and, and to show younger folks that, you know, you can have sight loss and you can be successful in whatever your endeavors are. So honestly, a kudos to like just sort of this program for doing what it's doing. But yeah, I, I think just connecting with these big organizations, if you haven't found, um, if you haven't grown up with anyone, um, you will find someone. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Well, thank you all so much. I wish we had more time to talk. This happens every time, um, but we uh, are gonna have to wrap up here. Um, so thank you so much to Stuart, Kia, Nick, and Clover for joining us today. That was really insightful and uh, I greatly appreciate it.